welcome to everybody. I really appreciate this turnout. We set up 100 chairs, and I see we're adding rows, so we're more than 100 people at this point. That's wonderful. This is um, civic involvement at its best. Um, I just want to introduce, I think uh, we have Ryan O'Donnell here. He is um, a counselor at large, so you have another city counselor here. Is there anybody else that I just haven't seen from the city council or other affairs? No. Um, so this meeting, I think, has the potential to kind of bring up some uh, very strong emotions, as I'm sure you all know. I want to ask people, um, when we get to the portion where there will be an opportunity to speak, that people uh, come up with as open a mind as possible, uh, try and remain calm, and, um, and to, for everyone in the audience just to really listen, to open up your minds and your hearts and listen to what people have to say. The format for the evening is that um, I'm going to hand this over to Wayne Biden, the Director of Planning and Sustainability for the city. Um, his office is working, and you'll explain about the multi-use plan separate. So the reason that this has come up again is that he is working on something that he will explain to you uh, what it is. Um, and this is only one portion of the plan that Wayne's office is working on, the, the hunting question. So this is set within a broader plan about um, use of uh, recreation spaces, conservation areas in the city. So Wayne is going to do a presentation about 15 minutes. Um, and then we're going to do something that allows you to ask informational questions before we get to the kind of speak out part of the evening. Um, we'll do it just 10 minutes of people raising their hands for Wayne to answer informational things. So if he just didn't cover something that you need more information on, you want some information tweaked, that's the period that you can ask those questions just for 10 minutes. After that, we're going to ask people to line up just three people at a time to speak to the audience. So you would line up here. When you see that there are only two people, you can come and stand up as the third person. I don't want a long line out the door. I don't think that that's going to be productive. Um, and then you're going to come and you're actually going to address this body. Um, the Lead Civic Association is co-sponsoring this, this evening with me. We have a timer from the Lead Civic Association. Karen Nelson is here somewhere. You're going to move up at that point, right? Yes. <laughs> and people are only going to have two minutes to speak. And I know that's not very long, but we have over 100 people here. And we would be here until midnight, I think, if people had longer than that. To speak. <coughs> so limit your remarks, please, to the two minutes. Karen will hold up a sign. We have NCTV here, Northampton uh, Community Television here taping this so that we will have a record of everything that people say. We also have um, Heidi from the Lead Civic Association taking notes. I'll be taking notes. So we are really um, trying to take in everything people say, write it down, and have a record from this meeting. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing that I should share? All right, so I'm handing this over to Wayne. Thanks. Thank you all. Can you hear me if I don't use the mic? I'll stay nearby, but I'm a wanderer. So um, I, I know you're mostly here talking about hunting. I just want to make sure you understand the context by which we're here. So um, we do a comprehensive open space recreation and multi-use trail plan. It used to be every five years. Now it's every seven years. Um, I date myself when I realize this is actually the sixth plan that I worked on. And so we've been doing this for a long time. It covers, not surprisingly, everything about open space, recreation, multi-use trail plan. It's our blueprint. When I got here almost 30 years ago, about 6% of the city was protected as open space. Now 25% the city is protected open space. So we do a lot of work in everything across the board. It's about conservation land, recreation, parks, agricultural land. Um, and so a lot of the plan is sort of where should we buy land for all those purposes? How should we be improving the land? How should we be managing the property? And how should we do trails? So out of all those things, the part that you're interested in is a subset of how should we manage the property? And it's about the hunting part. So that, that's sort of quick context. Um, so the, the, overall, you can say we've been buying lots of land over the years. Um, as we buy more land, in some ways, user conflicts go down. 
It used to be a limited lane for everyone to play on. Now there's more land, so we actually see less user conflicts, but there's still certainly user conflicts, hunting versus non-hunting, mountain biking versus walking, <coughs> horseback riding versus walking. Every sort of user conflict is out there. Um, for us, one of the big ones is a dramatic rise in homeless living in our, pot, in our land, how do we deal with that? So lots of different issues, and the plan has to address all those, those different things. Um, because we do this plan every now seven years, there's some things which we believe are settled for all time. So when we buy land, whether it's for parks or recreation or restrictions, we tie up the property in a series of mechanisms so it's basically impossible or as close to impossible as possible for that land to ever be developed. Okay. Federal government has a right of eminent domain. So the federal government decides that they want to build a military base and take our land by eminent domain. We can't stop them any more than you could at your property. But for anything the city wants to do, we've doubled, in many cases, triple protected it to make it involved. So those things aren't really on the table. How we manage the property is the stuff that comes up every seven years. And so some of you were involved with the same discussion about hunting seven years ago, and so sort of that, that I'm not going to spend time on this. There are 12 big actions, 12 big broad categories that we get involved with. So these are buying, open, uh, buying conservation land, buying recreation areas, improving recreation areas, um, think about how do we have a better role for people on the property. So again, lots of areas, if you're interested, talk to me afterwards, we can tell you sort of the rest of what the plan's all about. Um, the, the broad rubric that I think you're mostly interested in is this one of the, the one of 12 goals is we want open space to serve people. This is important because the majority of our conservation land is primarily preserved, is primarily protected for habitat preservation. We want to make sure that we have that land for centuries from now and that wildlife and flora and fauna can use the property. Okay. Um, but obviously, we live in a community of people, and so we manage our property also to serving the public. That's most obvious in parks and recreation. But in our conservation areas, that comes up as well. And there's a couple of core principles that we have followed. One is we are far more flexible about uses when we have user groups who are responsible for them. So Broad Brook Coalition, for example, we have devolved, if you will, more authority to manage that conservation area than anywhere else in the city because we have a, a user group who's willing to step up and do the work. We allow snowmobiles in two of our conservation areas because we have a wonderful partnership, and it, both because we had historical snowmobile use, they were there before we were, and because we have a partner who's done a great job of managing the property, we don't get complaints, people are happy for doing it. Um, we've been dealing with mountain bikers and hikers, and there have been some conflicts in the Solomon Hills, and there's been the rise of a mountain bike group um, who's sort of gonna you know, find compromise and make those things work. So that's sort of the core, compromise, the, the core principle. The other core principle we have, which probably what led to some of you being upset about where the plan is going, is, um, most of our property has not been open to hunting, but we want to think about all user groups in different areas. Not in the percentage of the city that they are, but at least to be some opportunity. So we have one small area where we allow ATVs. We have two areas where we allow map bikes. Um, we had one area we allow hunting for 20 years. Um, so we've, you know, we've sort of always dealt with this. They may be a small percentage, but at least we don't say that we're excluding the groups. The one exception is we will exclude any group where we're, concerned, we're convinced is creating ecological damage to the property. So we're more flexible about user conflicts, less flexible about the core principle of preserving the ecological value of the property. So that's sort of how we got here. The rest we're going to talk about is hunting. Um, so again, in terms of the, the history, this came up seven years ago, the last time there was a plan. There were a number of hunters, certainly a small minority of people who came to the hearing, but a number of hunters who said, we pay taxes, we, you know, we buy open space, um, and we think that, that's, that we should be thinking about land for hunting. There was either one or two city councils, I forgot which, who were really advocating us to look at it. Um, what we did at the time is we said, this is worthy of a conversation. We should spend more time thinking about where hunting makes sense, where it doesn't make sense, sort of rationalize. And then there was sort of a three-year period with a, a lot of public hearings, some of you may were, be involved with, where we looked at that. We kept Rainbow Beach as it was, 
we got rid of hunting at the one section in the, the Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake region where we thought it didn't make sense. We added archery, um, hunting, so bone arrows only on the section of Beaver Brook on the east side of the brook itself, nor, you know, basically opposite the National Grid property, um, going back there. Um, and then we didn't do other properties. Um, the other place this comes up from time to time is every time we buy pieces of property. Right? Every piece of property has different users. So even though the properties we're buying are typically private and it's not necessarily open to the public, all those properties have strong constituencies. And every time we buy land, there's somebody who says, this is great, I get to do more of what I want to do, or this is horrible, I get to do less of what I want to do. And so this certainly comes up for hunting. Every time we buy a piece of property, somebody's been hunting on the property. And so we lose constituents, frankly. We say, you know, you, you think everyone likes open space. When I got here 30 years ago, there were some constituents who didn't want us to do open space. That's a lot less now, but we're still getting sort of the, the people who are saying, I've been using this property, the neighbors are happy, it's worked well. And so each time we buy a property, we have this conversation. We also have the conversation typically with the person who sells us the property. We are happy to take property with any restrict, any reasonable restrictions. And we've had some people who tell us, I want to sell you this property, but with the condition, you have to allow hunting. We've also had some people, um, frankly, more people who said, I want to sell this property, but with the condition that you do allow it. And our position is we're happy, we would take either one of those, but it has a value, right? If you restrict us, it's going to reduce the value, and almost everybody who we have this conversation with says, well, I either like hunting or I don't like hunting, but not enough so to sell you the property at a discount. So almost every property we get has, not all, because there's some that have restrictions one way or another. But almost every property we get, um, the, the owner, the sellers in the end say, it's up to the city, we understand it. Um, and so we go through a similar process. Um, so that's sort of how we got here. Again, I promise you, probably won't be me, but seven years from now, I'm sure this, all, this whole thing will come up again. Because unlike buying land where it's forever, the land use restrictions are regulations of the Conservation Commission, and they can change. So then the last thing before we launch into this is, so you know this is sort of a two-step process. We do this planning process every seven years, and we create a series of recommendations. What, what are we going to do? Those recommendations are our best analysis based on lots of outreach, based on lots of boards inputting into this, but they are binding on absolutely nobody. So hunting, for example, after we do the plan, whatever the plan says, it will go to the Conservation Commission at some point, and they will have a series of public hearings <coughs> on specific pieces of property, very concrete. So if you, whatever side you're on today, if you lose the battle today, know you get to come back before the Conservation Commission. And if you win the battle today, know you should come back before the Conservation Commission. There are no winners of the Well, that's the next thing I was going to address, which is one of the questions people ask is, am I biased in this process? So I, I want to disclose my own bias and lack of bias. First, in terms of hunting and non-hunting, I really don't care. I could care less whether really open land to hunting or not to hunting. When we go through the analysis, I'll tell you why in a little while. I have no preference for this. I do, as a planner, my job is sort of building consensus. So the part that I have an institutional bias on is I really hope there aren't winners and losers. I hope we find something that everybody can leave the room today and everyone can leave the process and say, I didn't get everything I want but I got a lot of what I want. So that, that sort of my bias is not what the outcome is, but in sort of pushing us to find some sort of consensus, some sort of compromise. And, and you want to know that consensus doesn't mean you all agree. It means you can walk away and not lose sleep over it. So, so that's sort of where we are. I want to go through this just quickly. And this is partially, so I'm really glad you're all getting a chance to talk today. We had suggested a somewhat different format and the reason is I really am worried when everybody talk, comes up and talks that you're going to be writing notes on what you want to say and not listening to your peers. Um, and so I sort of want to give you a series of things to think about. This is sort of our analysis from what we've heard. And so if you disagree with these, those are things I'd like to hear the most. If you're just going to say what everybody else has said, it's not that useful, right? You want to, I mean, I think what you want is not just to be heard, but to influence the process. So the way you influence the process is to do active listening build on what other people say, and move the conversation along. So that's what we're going to try to do. So just running through this quickly, and I hope this 
the song's big enough for you all. So it's pretty obvious that no matter what we do, there are going to be winners and losers. Um, and there are significant amount of people who don't want hunting, either because they don't believe in hunting or because they're worried about user conflict, and they're going to benefit by not relying on hunting. And there's a significant number of hunters and people who are fine with hunting, and they're going to benefit by allowing hunting. Um, likewise, it's, it's funny, the, the last time this came up, the thing we got most email about is, how dare you, and fill in the blank, allow hunting or don't allow hunting, because we think that's a violation of what conservation is all about. So people feel very deep, deep right? So those of you who are historians, you go back to the progressive conservationists, so where the term conservation was born, that was really about multiple use of property. Now, again, I'm not advocating that, but that was the birth of conservation in this country. The way the word came out was about multiple use of property. So clearly hunters are going to say conservation is totally consistent with it. And then clearly a lot of people who are in <coughs> open space say we want this to be our crown jewels, our parks, our pristine areas where we're a visitor and we're not influencing things and they're going to think it's not consistent with conservation. And there's no right and there's no wrong about that, but just know everyone's going to do the same thing. Um, adverse environmental impacts, frankly, there's really not significant impacts from either one. Right? So, you know, in, in a state which controls the deer herd, we're not going to affect the population, right? So deer, you know, hunters will argue, well, we're going to have a few less roadkill and a few less ticks when we, when we do deer hunting. And non-hunters may say, well, you know, in natural selection, the old and the young are dying. People in my demographic are dying from starvation. And the healthy deer aren't going to die, and so we're changing who survives. But the reality is, if you look at population, but I took, I'm not advocating this, but I took wildlife biology 40 years ago. And I took it in an area which had a managed deer herd. So usually deer are owned by the people, not by an individual. In this case, the university I went to actually owned a deer herd with 20 foot high fences so they couldn't come out. And they did some of these classic population dynamic studies where they would shoot all, a huge number, like 90% of the deer. And they'd measure how quickly the deer came back. Or they'd actually introduce deer and they'd measure how quickly they died back. It doesn't have an effect on the population other than a very short term. Okay. So it's not going to have an environmental impact. You may not like it for other reasons. I'm not, not arguing against that. Um, the, the humane approach, again, hunters will say the same deer are going to die. They're going to be hit by cars or starve to death. Non-hunters will say we think shooting is sort of an unnatural thing and we don't want to do that, particularly if we get healthy ones. Um, and salary benefits. Again, there are some very minor ones in terms of, of ticks, but I think there have been some studies that mice are actually carrying more ticks than deer. Um, this isn't my area, so some of you correct me, but again, it's not going to have a significant impact one way or another. The user conflicts are clearly the area where, where we hear from people most often, right? I want to be able to run and let my dog off leash, or I want to be able to walk and not worry about when I can walk, and so the, there, there are some very real user conflicts. I'm absolutely sure someone tonight will bring up the woman who was shot in upstate New York. Right? So it always comes up. There are, you know, things happen. Um, so that's certainly an issue. We try to address that in the next map about where we were suggesting as a first approach making this work. Um, user misuse is definitely an issue. And again, we have misuse from every group. There's no question we have misuse from hunters who shoot up signs and hunt where they shouldn't do or hunt from vehicles. But frankly, we have misuse from every single group that's out there. Um, and our experience is the way we reduce the risks is building the partnerships. So if Broadbrook Coalition is having misuse on their property, I don't know because they're dealing with it. Right? So where we have partners, they, they're mostly dealing. So that's really our, our best thing. Um, alternative sites are available, and I want to come back to that because I have some maps in a second <coughs> on if there was a, a belief that we should be allowing hunting, where are the right places? So I'll come to that in a second. Second, um, uh, and then appropriate areas. So the first one is about are there other places that are available anyway in other people's property, private property, state property, et cetera. The second point is, if we're allowing it on city-owned property, are these the right areas? Um, and then overall, if you can guess, hunters want more, not hunters want less. Um, and then concerns about guns in public space is certainly an issue, and obviously as the administration of Washington is trying to liberalize gun, or reduce gun regulations, this becomes more of an issue, I think, for um, So that's sort of the background. Then I want to talk specifically. So this was, there was a series of slides, I'll go through these. These are sort of our cuts. We ha we've had, this is the fourth public hearing in different formats, per public format uh, forum on the open space plan. This was just about hunting. Um, so as we sort of listen to people, we developed sort of what we thought made sense. So as I say, we've allowed hunting on Rainbow Beach for years. We almost have to do that because the land to the south and the land to the north is owned by the state. 
and they allow hunting, and it would be very weird to have the property in the middle. In fact, the state helps manage our property, and that was their cost for us allowing them to hunt. Um, we used to allow it in the Fitzgerald Lake region, uh, and we got rid of that. So the proposal is sort of three areas. Beaver Brook, the name's getting some people scared. This is the Beaver Brook, not the Beaver Brook behind the homes and leaves, but the Beaver Brook across the street from the National Grid, from, from Mass Electric, on the other side of the stream. Um, the so-called Girl Scout Back 40, so 40 acres we bought from the Girl Scouts. It doesn't actually have frontage, it's only accessible from the Snowmobile Trail. And then the section of Mineral Hills, which we bought from Joan Sarafin, which is off of Chesterfield Road. So the, those are three that we're talking about. That adds up to 270 acres, which is just under 9% of the city's conservation area. So this is sort of a zoom out just to get a, a context. So on this map, so there's a lot of open, other open space that's not on this map. This map only has city-owned conservation. It doesn't have private property, which might be restricted. It doesn't have state property. It doesn't have nonprofits. It just has the universe that we're talking about here. Right? So this is the land that the city owns as conservation land, um, of which, say, 9%. And you can see where, where these parcels are. So there is a concentration of these parcels and leaves which your council raised when we first did an introduction to city council, and I suspect it is some of you are concerned. Even people who aren't against hunting may be concerned why there's all of these. The reason is we looked at um, sort of what are the user conflict issues. And the areas that have the least amount of users, right? So either no trails or very limited trails. We have various measures by which we measure trail use. These places have the least amount of use. Um, are these four areas plus Elwell Island, and Elwell Island is probably not going to a lot of people who's crossing my river and going through. So, so we sort of chose these, and what are the areas that have the least amount of user conflict that's out there? Um, so then, this is sort of zooming in on the leads piece. So the three areas, again, are the Beaverbrook property across from National Grid, the Girl Scout property that's south of that, the Mineral Hills property that's just south of Chesterfield Road. The red area is the area that Massachusetts doesn't allow hunting in any way. So, and I'm not a hunter, so I don't know the numbers, but I believe it's 500 feet from a road and 500 feet from a house. Someone can correct me if I'm not, that's right. Okay. So, my GIS guy basically just looked those things up and he, he dropped them. So those are areas which, regardless of what our rules are, <coughs> wouldn't allow hunting already. The area to the north, this one here, already allows hunting now, but again, only bow and arrow. So, all very low use. Um, and so then, just to zoom in. So this is the Mineral Hills property. There is a trail, an old log, and so this is the section that's right in Chesterfield Road, but because of the 500 feet, we wouldn't be talking about allowing hunting anyway there. Um, there is an old logging road which comes in from here. We, because we just bought this property two or three years ago, we've been particularly monitoring to get a sense of what's the use out there. And again, people use every inch of land in the city, so it's not that nobody uses this but this is one of our lowest use areas in the city. My wife and I walk every single weekend in different, almost every weekend in a different conservation area, and she won't let me go here because the trail is so covered with overgrowth that she's worried about ticks, right? That's probably the only place in the city where she's not willing to let me go because it's so overgrown. So, you know, certainly some indications of what that is. This property, these two areas with hatches, those are areas which are, pub which are privately owned but publicly protected. We have a conservation restriction on both those parcels, which prevent them from ever being developed. This one, our restriction includes public access, but not necessarily hunting. And this one, only this little corner, includes public access. So the rest is private, the public can't go. These, the public can go. Um, I frankly didn't even look up our restriction to see if we're allowed to have a hunting. I suspect we're not, but that wasn't in our goal. We only want to focus on property that, that we own. So then the same sort of uh, zoom in on the area uh, over here. So National Grid, Mass Electric right here. Again, there's a stream here. Um, so, actually the stream's right here. So within 500 feet of the road and 500 feet of homes, <coughs> no hunting would be there. On the other side, likewise, this area would be no hunting. The Girl Scouts, um, again, doesn't have access to the road, but most of it's further back. Um, the only access is either Cross country. Right now, there's a snowmobile trail which comes roughly this way, and 
So people certainly can walk in the snow, which is a lovely walk, whether it's snowmobile or not. It's one of my favorite walks in town. Um, but it's another place that, that some people come in. And we just bought a piece of land that comes all the way out of North Farms Road. We haven't developed it for a formal trail, but we will be doing that at some point. Um, so, but there's some access to this is, is difficult. Um, and this one really, unless you're trespassing, that snowmobile trail is the only way this is. Um, so again, you know, small piece of the entire city. We did look at other places. And again, you know, the user conflict stuff, I don't want to uh, overstate. If everyone here said we should be allowed hunting in, snow, in, in Soma Hills, with signage we can minimize user conflicts, and so I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying in this cut, what we did is we identified the areas where there's almost no user conflict. So all these other areas have more people using them, but hunting and people certainly can coexist. Whatever we do, we would do a signage camp. So on the bottom, you see the three current signs that we use. So on the right is the sign we typically use around conservation areas. We place these roughly about every 100 feet. We only started doing this about a year ago, so two years ago. So most of the areas are not yet marked, but we're in the process of marking every single boundary line we own. And these are the signs that face out. And right now, it's no hunting. This is sort of the equivalent for along trails. So we have a couple trails, like along the Mill River, we just have a narrow band, so that's the equivalent there, and then this one faces the other direction, right? We certainly have a problem when people are on public property and they think it's all public, and they're in the middle of the woods, and the yellow blaze doesn't stop them from trying to warn them that, you know, it's going on private property. So if we were allowing, we, we haven't bothered these at Rainbow Beach because it's so far in the middle of nowhere, but if we were allowing hunting in any of our areas, we would just do a new one of these things, um, and we allow hunting. How big are these? They're small. They're four inches, something like that. Time. They're tiny, but we, we, do, we do them in frequency, so we have more of them, so it's hard to miss them going up. Um, and then there's always a concern that there's, you know, if you looked at those maps, there are some areas where to get to the areas where someone hunts, they'd be walking through areas which they can't hunt. Um, and that always concerns people because that's closer to your home, right? If you're in your home and you're in your hot tub and someone's walking by with a shotgun, that's a good, that, we get calls from that's someone concerned. So we would do the same sort of things. In fact, that there's hunting groups who would actually post that for us because they want to, you know, work, they want to be a partner and you know. um, So the rest of the time is really going to be up for you. I just want to sort of start with, you know, Councilor talked about sort of what are the rules of communication. I sort of want to do two sets of rules for you. The first is you can do anything you want, but it doesn't, you know, if you're just an advocate for a position, you're repeating what the person said before. It's really not going to help. Right, because we want to try to sort of start building consensus, try to figure out where we're going. So think strategically, right? How, how do you influence the process the most? And so there's this whole sort of process on, on what we talk about when we're listening. But, but, you know, the most important rule is, right, listen, listen, listen. You've all heard the old saying, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen to what other people say so you're not just making sure you're keeping your points. You're, you're, you're actively listening and how can you respect? Don't judge. There's no bad ideas here. Um, so, you know, whatever it is that feels dear, close to you is important, but don't bash other people and respect it. So this, this third one just takes a little interpretation. Um, so this is the interest versus positions. This is sort of an inside negotiation world. But this is, if I go to my boss tomorrow and say, can I have a salary increase? That's a position he either says yes or he says no. If I go to him and say, I want to be respected more among my peers, you know, can I have a salary increase or send me to a conference or you know, pat me in the back, you know, and I really want to respect, that may be an easier deal. So, so step back, don't just get stuck in the position. So is it that you don't want hunting anywhere, anytime, or is it you're worried about someone shooting your dog or someone shooting you? Um, or for the hunters, is it that you want every inch of land open for everywhere because you think it's an equity piece? Um, or is it that you want to make sure that you get to recreate the city that you live in, pay taxes? So sort of think about those things as you make your comments. Um, do you have like a, a calendar of when the hunting seasons are? I don't. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's something almost all the time, but squirrel hunting isn't necessarily the thing that scares me, right? So, but I don't. There, there. I think there are a lot of hunters who probably can answer. Or you can go on to massfishandwildlife.com, or they do have, I believe, they're at Walmart. Um, they have magazines that tell you all the hunting seasons. Um, I will. Every season, every date, every rule that they have to go by. We, we, it's 
7.30 and we said we would do 10 minutes of just informational questions. Which so that's who we are. So this, but, is, this is now your time. Just so people know, we're launching just questions. You're not making personal statements or anything of that nature. It's really just to elicit more concrete information for the next 10 minutes. And you get lots of chance to make those statements. Yeah. So two informational questions. The Mineral Hills parcel that we're talking about, does the conservation restriction currently restrict hunting? So the land that we own, um, it does not. The restriction does not restrict hunting. Um, when we do restrictions on our, because again, we want to, you know, we're, when we put restrictions on our property, we're doing restrictions forever. So when we do restrictions on our property, we don't prohibit hunting, even though we often don't allow it, even most often we don't. We want to allow those options. Oh, yeah. The other question is, for that parcel in the Mineral Hills, to get to that parcel, do you have to cross private property? No. It's a thin band. It's a relative 50 foot wide strip you're going on, but no, you can totally stay on our property. And get back. And in fact, the way you'd want to walk is on ours, because that's where the old logging road is. Thank you. Wayne, could you put the slide back up where you show the outline of the pr property? Just whatever. Uh, first, zoom in more. Even if you had a the larger version of that? Could you point out the roads and how they, how close they go to the parcel? I point out the one, I'm sorry. Could you point out the intersecting roads and how you would get there? The roads, yeah, okay. Sylvester or whatever? Yeah, okay. So this is the one off the Haydenville Road, and the road is right here. Sorry, we didn't highlight it. So that's the road, and, and, but that, because of the wetlands, you can't really easily cross. So the way most people will walk is the Snowmobile Trail, which goes from North Farms Road, and I forgot if it's just in Northampton or just over in Williamsburg. But the Snowmobile Trail goes all the way up to here, and it cuts all the way down, and the gate to the Smith Folk Forestry Land, um, or basically where Little Park Diner used to be. That, that, that's where the Snowmobile Trail comes. So most people coming here are going to come in the Snowmobile Trail. How about the other one in Leeds? Okay, so you got that one. So on Leeds, so this is Chesterfield Road, Montague Road, and there's a sort of gate here, so most people will probably come from the gate here and come down through here. And again, we assign here, so there's no hunting that section. And where's Sylvester Road on that map? So, uh, I'm sorry, Sylvester Road's way over here. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you. you. And what about Sylvester Road's here. So, the store is that landowner has a lot of money on their property that are water property owner on the land here. Okay. Yeah. Wait, can you say something about the process going forward? Have you published the entire seven-year plan, not just the hunting piece, but the no, whole thing? No, we, we want to do the public forums first. So Since. when will it be available and how? Um, so it'll be available online, and I guess it depends when we start, when we think there's fewer questions. So our deadline is we need to get it adopted by March so we can apply for grants for next year. Okay. <clears throat> and you mentioned going to the CONSCOM. Does it... Is, do they make a decision or do they make a recommendation to city council? So it's ultimately the planning board is the legal authority. So the only board that has to approve the plan is the planning board. As a matter of practice, we've gone to like five or six boards and asked them to endorse it. Conservation Commission, because ultimately, unless they want to follow the session, you know, the Parks and Recreation Commission, City Council, Transportation and Parking. And, and we specifically say in that endorsement of the plan doesn't mean you endorse every recommendation. And of course, so there's a few options in this plan. We may say, allow hunting, don't allow hunting, or we could say, future study, right? We, what we don't want to do is hold up grants for this year if we don't feel like we can reach a consensus for it. So far, this is, you know, there's lots of issues. So the reason we haven't written the plan yet is we want to narrow down the scope. So far, this is the only issue we've heard, which seems like big disagreements. Yeah. And the access point for the Southern parcel, that thin one, was that the same snowmobile road or was that a different access point? Uh, uh, the other last one? Uh, yes, that lowest. Yes. So this is the snowmobile trail there, and that's really the best access point. For both of those. <coughs> for both of them. Okay. Right. right. Now, you know, if you got permission, the, when the Girl Scouts owned it, it was great access. That's not our property. I don't even know who owns it anymore. Would you talk about all-terrain vehicles and where you're planning to use Sure. So that hasn't changed from what we have before. We just have the overall map. So we allow um, ATVs, or what we call the Jeep Eater Trail. So there's a section of land which we bought which had historic Jeeps on the property. We allow that. Again, we've had a user group, less formalized, but a group that's been very responsible. Um, it's a fence. I think it's right here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is getting a little yellow here. 
So, um, so we've allowed ATVs there only the piece. We, you know, none of these things. We, we always, we scare them deliberately. So, if there's ever misuse, we have the right to change our mind. So we allow it there, and then we allow snowmobile trails here. Um, the properties I was talking about, these two over here, um, and. We've talked about it on the snowmobile trail, the snowmobiles just on Turkey Hill Road. That's the area we are having abuse. We're having people who are on Turkey Hill Road and, go, and going onto our property. So it's gonna be a decision point. If we can find a user group who can do a good job of policing, we'd like to keep allowing snowmobiles on Turkey Hill Road. If we find people keep going onto other conservation properties more sensitive, we're not going to allow. Let's do one more question. Yeah, okay. How many North Hampton residents have hunting I don't know the answer. I tried to Google it and couldn't find the answer. Um, I don't know if anybody knows. Okay. I think we'll just line up here three, three. I don't think we're going to do the opposed because I don't want us to draw those lines in the sand. Um, so if people want to speak now, um, please come up, one, two, three, and then after somebody sits down, a third person can come up again. Um, and you're going to be asked to come to the mic um, to look out at your peers. And Karen is right here in the front row, and she will be holding up a sign. Karen? You're going to be holding up a sign that says one minute, one minute and ten seconds. I just want to do one thing before I start. So I'm going to leave some index cards in the back of the room and some pencils and pens. If you either are totally uncomfortable speaking publicly or feel like you run out of time or after you speak had another thought, feel free to sort of write your comments right on here and, and we're looking at this way. So, um, yeah, Bill, if you want to start. Well, my name is Bill Velasquez. I'm here speaking in favor of the proposals to hunt down the city property. Um, I question how our city, um, which is known to be acceptance of all people in all groups, cannot accept hunters to have a small portion of the property to use. Um, I find no sanctuary in our sanctuary city. We make sanctuary for everyone, but we're talking about leaving groups out with this stuff. Um, I'm a resident, I'm a taxpayer, we need to have equality and fairness through all user groups. Um, I'm a member of a snowmobile club, hunting club. We work with other people and other groups to do things cooperatively and to get it to work for everyone. Um, this plan needs to work for the whole public, all of the residents of Northampton, not, not just a select few. Um, hunters pay a fee in licensing, we buy a land stamp to purchase conservation lands. Um, we are not allowed to hunt on Sundays. There are not many <coughs> other user groups that I can think of that we're talking about tonight that pay fees, um, have a mandatory land stamp, and cannot use a piece of property out of one day on the weekend. Um, I did some numbers on turkey, deer, and bear hunting, which is basically the three big game species. Season-wise, that equivalates to about 107 days in a year. Okay, that's less than a third of the 365 days that the average hunter is a field. Um, we're also policed by a group, the Environmental Police Department, that we help fund, that polices the things we do. Um, U.S. Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife in 2013 said that hunters put $24.9 billion a year into our economy, and average hunter spends $2,484 in their pursuit of hunting. Thank you. John Clapp, Florence. Um, I'm not opposed to hunting in general, and I've hunted myself in the past, but I'm totally opposed to opening hunting in Mineral Hills. My family will be impacted the most as our land parallels this, this proposed area. We will not be the only ones affected as Mineral Hills Hiking Trail is part of, of the proposed land. It's been stated that there are a few hikers who use, uh, use these trails. Uh, 
but in fact, they, many people do. I have led hikes for West Ham Council on Aging and other groups. Our b, &B guests use it often, as well as many others. If this is allowed to be open to hunting, the access path will have to be shared by hikers and hunters. 30 or 40 years ago, land in general was more accessible to hunters, and a number of hikers were limited. But times have changed. More people want to be outside, uh, and hikers need a place where, they, where there is no hunting, where they can enjoy uh, nature, free from the sound of shotguns piercing their tranquility. People are uncomfortable with guns, and hunting uh, needs uh, hunter, uh, hunt, hunting needs uh, uh, hikers need places they can feel safe. And there are far more hikers these days than hunters. In the past, hunters have put up tree stands on our private property, and they have also shot through our no trespassing signs. I'm sure the majority of the hunters have better ethical standards than this, but opening up this area only increases the chance of mistakes. Mineral Hills has been billed as a wildlife corridor and should remain that way. There are 200,000 acres under the purview of West Mass Wildlife set, uh, set aside in Massachusetts for hunting, and thousands more, both public and private, many within 10 minutes of Northampton. I will leave you with a quote from Thoreau. To preserve wild, uh, to preserve wild, um, there's my quote, uh, to preserve wild animals implies generally the creation of a forest for them to dwell in or resort to. So it is with me. And uh, this was someone's handiwork that I pulled off of the uh, trees. Um, I forgot to mention, I would really appreciate it if people could identify themselves, what street they live on, and where. If you're in Leeds, if you're in another part of the city, um, that would be really helpful. Thanks. Hi, my name is Erica Childs. I'm from Florence, off of Ryan Road. Um, I'm 22 years old and have lived in Northampton my entire life. Um, tonight I'm going to give you guys some facts so you're a little bit more aware of hunting Massachusetts and you can also look up online uh, Mass Fish and Wildlife and Mass.gov. To legally hunt in the state of Massachusetts you must be 15 years or older and buy a hunting permit. Also you need to complete a basic hunter education course. And if using a firearm, you must also obtain a firearms identification license. Basic hunter education courses are free and held all over the state. They teach you handling of firearms as well as hunting regulations and maps, such as legal hunting begins 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 minutes after sunset, what we call legal shooting light. It is light enough then to see anything. You cannot discharge a firearm with 150 feet of a road or 500 feet from a dwelling and also the 10 basic rules of firearm safety, which include such things as treat every firearm as if it's loaded and never point a firearm at something you do not intend to shoot. To obtain an FID in the state of Mass, you have to go to your local police department, pay a $100 fee, and go through fingerprinting and a background check. Hunting license start at $27.50, not including the automatic $5 charge for a wildland stamp that, and I quote off, line goes into wildland conservation funds which buys important wildlife habitat that is open to hunting, fishing, and trapping as well as other outdoor recreation. After buying a basic hunting license you can add different stamps at five dollars each to be able to hunt varying types of game and forms of hunting. Other than donations the average outdoorsman or woman does not have to pay such fees to do the recreation of their choosing. Hunters, however, have to pay multiple fees for a short time of the year with no guarantee of a harvest. So please try to keep that in mind and also look online if you have any questions. Can, can I ask, just make a suggestion about the people lining up because I can't see the speaker. If you could, can you line up to the side in the Maybe front? Maybe we can seat? have, yeah, have, have, have people, people sit in these seats Thank here. You. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dee Wildclap. I live on Chesterfield Road in Florence. The Mineral Hills property that's being discussed is actually in Florence. Our property and the Mineral Hills land in question has been in my husband's family for over 150 years. Their stewardship is what protected it for so long and allowed the animals to thrive. 
their decency in not developing it and instead putting as much as possible into conservation on both sides of, of Chesterfield Road was done to extend the proposed wildlife corridor forever. We did not expect to have to stand here again battling for safety, for peace and quiet, and for the animals. Frankly, I'm shocked that the city is considering this terrible idea on land that right now has a sign that in part reads, no motorized vehicles and no hunting. Some say that there's nobody that's using that land. I live there, I can tell you for a fact that we run a llama farm and a bed and breakfast. We and our guests and our neighbors hike there daily. Our west border abuts this land in question. Neighbors and hiking groups use this area, and many of us who live nearby are out here constantly. We deserve to do so without fear. I am one of those people who is deathly afraid of guns. The sound in our area reverberates. It scares me to death. I do not, I get scared seeing you guys walking on the streets. I really do not want guns out that way. I do not want to see a hiker, a guest, a dog, or a family member afraid, and I don't want anybody to be shot. This area was set aside as a wildlife corridor and is open to hunting. Hiking is on the rise while the number of hunters is decreasing, and not all hunters are respectful. We often see uh, trucks parked at the sign that I just noted, ignoring the posting. We have seen people putting, ribbing down every one of our no trespassing signs. They have hung, hung, hung up those deer stands on our post property. People here may be very respectful. I appreciate that, but folks who do hunting do not respect the property. And I can tell you that many people have told me over the last couple of days that this has been an issue on their land as well. Do not allow hunting on this property. Thank you. My name is Diane Palladino. I live on Sylvester Road. Every day I walk out, I see hunters' cars, hunters' trucks, hunters, and guns. They hunt all around me. I have nine acres. I have a fenced-in area around the backyard for a dog, my dog. And just to be sure, since the day we moved in there, 27 years ago, we put orange fencing around to make sure you don't shoot my dog. There are always hunters around, and it's not just bear season, not just deer season, whether it's squirrel season, there's always something to shoot, which means there's always a gun to shoot, which means if I go in those areas where hunting is allowed on Sylvester Road, and there are private property where that's allowed, if I go near there, I, you can have a gun and you can shoot. I don't like it, I'm sick of it. Two Sundays ago, I was outside my backyard. Boom! 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 My usual response is I walk in the middle of my backyard, I scream my head off. It's Sunday, stop shooting. Sometimes that's worse. This Sunday, it didn't work. Boom! For two hours, I finally <clears throat> called the cops. They said they were gonna send somebody out. I don't know if they did. Also, this whole business about taxpayers. I'm a taxpayer, and I have the right to walk on any land, not private land, any city's land, without the fear of being hurt. Now, if we're talking mountain bikes, they can hit me, but they're not going to kill me. If we're talking ATVs, I'm not so excited, but they can watch I can watch out for. But a gun, I can't watch out for. So being on Sylvester Road is no picnic, and there's hunting all around us. We have nine acres. And I assure you that those are, are, are no trespassing signs have been torn down time and time again. So I'm not a happy camper. Good evening. I live on Turkey Hill Road and um, heard a lot of the statements tonight. And uh, I'm an avid hiker and hunter and, and all of that. And she was talking about uh, gunshots going off on a Sunday and that irritates me more than anything because that's illegal also gunshots after sunset or before sunrise that's illegal that's not real hunters that is poachers um, so some of that that's causing problems avid hunters disagree with as well and I don't like gunshots close to my house either because I have a family <clears throat> what I will say is that hiking in the woods I've never been afraid because uh, a real hunter puts the sights on the animal he's trying to shoot, not a hiker or a dog or a squirrel or whatever. <clears throat> I shot a deer a month ago in New York, 
And I was 100% sure that was a deer. There was no hiker, there was no dog or anything. So I think a lot of this argument is kind of um, not a real argument. I don't want to hike in an area where I'm afraid of being shot either. So I disagree with bad hunters. Um, but I do agree with responsible hunting, and I agree with being able to hike in a safe environment. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't do a lot of public speaking. Um, so, you know, the woman that was just up here, I agree. If I was her, I'd be pissed. Gunshots, and it's my backyard, my dog, and I don't agree with any of that. Responsible hunters, I think there is, there is a spot for them. And living where I live in Mineral Hills, <clears throat> I ran into hikers, I ran into snowmobilers, hunters, and once in a great while, someone's an asshole. They throw garbage while they're hiking or whatever. Um, for the most part, hunters respect the woods, and I, I disagree with banning hunting because they're some savage or something. Uh, they're some of the most respectful people that I deal with. We hunt, we hike, we scout the land, and uh, the shooting the gun is a very small aspect of it, and no one should be shooting 10 shots or whatever. You should take one good shot, get your animal, and go. That's all I have to say. someone's house and make an animal endangered and hurt yourself or your family. <clears throat> and I'm a vegetarian. Hi, uh, my name is Shana. I live with my son in Leeds on Chesterfield Road. Uh, we actually moved to Northampton about a year ago from Israel. Um, and in Florence, we were barely close to the shooting range there, and it greatly disturbed us to hear gunshots going off. Uh, about in June, we actually bought our house in Chesterfield. We were really happy to be part, uh, become part of this community and intend to stay here for many years to come. And when I found out that Northampton wants to expand hunting close to my house, I was deeply disturbed, uh, knowing that there's many other um, hunting sites that can be uh, sought out that are far away from where I personally live and far away from other places where children like my, my kid and other youth uh, might go and not notice where the signs are and stumble upon them. Um, and bullets don't know any signs. Bullets don't know boundaries. We've heard way too many gun violence all across the country. Um, I seriously don't want, uh, I want to be able to reduce guns and bullets uh, completely in this area, regardless uh, of the rights for people to have open spaces. Uh, I will say that I'm a vegan, so obviously that's my perspective, uh, but I hope that you see, hear someone that's a Boy Scout and respects the um, nature, and actually the only animals that I do eat is the fish that my son catches, kills, um, and cooks for me. So I do understand that connection to nature, but I also think that we have to reduce guns in our community <coughs> and not uh, increase them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joe Blasky. I live off of Ryan Road in Florence. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that I do understand everybody's worry about safety, about their animals especially. Um, there are four dogs, three cats, and a bunny rabbit in my home, and they're like family to us. So I do understand that. I just want everyone to be open here. So um, I'd like to speak about fairness and equality, equality for everyone, even hunters. A town that prides itself on acceptance of everyone should be able to allow others who have different views than yours the same rights. It's neither fair nor equal to push others out of your way to gain what you believe is right because it works in your favor. It's also not fair to tell us to go somewhere else because you don't like what we do. We're only asking for a small portion and 9%. That's a very, very small amount in my opinion. Um, we're asking for 9%. Um, and it's only during hunting season. This is not all year round. It's not 365 days a year and it's never on Sunday. So um, I'd also like to add, after the last meeting, I have a family member 
who was personally attacked for their views and I just I really want everyone to be open to this this is why we're all here to work together for an awesome outcome that works in everyone's favor nobody should feel attacked here we should all feel welcome we should all feel like we can get up here and speak without feeling like there's going to be repercussions for voicing our opinion so that's all I have to say I hope we can come to a conclusion together and that everyone can be happy Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sheila France. I live out on Coles Meadow Road. I'm not familiar with any of the conservation of the department's property, but I am thoroughly familiar with the Kabosiak property that the conservation department just recently bought in the last couple of years. Over 80 acres, where now my property is literally surrounded by conservation property. For 40, over 40 years, I've had the privilege of being able to step out in my backyard and hunt over 80 to 100, 150 acres of pristine environment. It's always been free to anyone who wanted to use it. It is still always free to anyone that wants to use it, except <coughs> hunters. I applied for permission. <coughs> sign says hunting by permission I was advised I was denied, denied because there is no hunting allowed there at the present time I would respectfully su submit anyone hunting anyone in this room that goes on any conservation property would be safer from hunters than they will be driving out of this parking lot this afternoon because no hunter has been sh shot or killed in Massachusetts for as far back as I can recall. And then you can't say that about driving a motor vehicle. Hunting is safer than being in church. That's for damn sure. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Zimmerman. I'm a resident uh, of Florence and uh, also president of Broadway Coalition, which manages Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area for the city. The city of Northampton has done an absolutely splendid job of protecting forests, fields, streams, and lakes for passive recreation by people and uh, to provide habitat for plants and animals. A case in point is Beaverbrook Greenway, which constitutes an important part of a wildlife corridor that, as shown in the map which Wayne presented earlier, almost with some rates, but almost encircles Northampton. It is prime habitat for many kinds of wildlife. Not only deer, but bear, bobcats, Coyotes, foxes, smaller mammals, a variety of amphibians and reptiles. It um, is. Can you use the mic? I think people are having a hard time hearing you in the back. Sure. Well, I guess I'm not going to be able to get it much higher. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the land in question, including Girl Scouts, uh, Beaverbrook, Greenway, and part of the Randall property shown on Wayne's map. Uh, the Broadbrook Coalition has contributed thousands of dollars to the purchase of those properties with either the tacit or explicit reservation that hunting not be allowed. While I am not personally opposed to hunting, I find no compelling reason to open conservation area, valuable conservation area land, to hunting in Northampton. There is ample land very close to Northampton. All the state parks, forests, wildlife management areas, all are open to hunting. And there's no reason why people can't get in their car and drive 20 or 30 minutes to access those open areas. Thank you.
name is Mitch Hartley. Um, I live off Ryan Road in Florence. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist and I've been a wildlife professional for 30 years. Um, and I would like to talk a little bit about sort of some of the facts because I think it's impossible to argue against safety concerns and fear. That's too primal, it's too central to life, life and death. No one can argue against that. But the problem as I see it is there's a really big difference between the perception that people have of the risk and the fear and the reality. And uh, what I just heard the last gentleman say, or the uh, previous gentleman, about safety is, is true. And there's a lot of statistics. If you go online, look at the CDC website, there's, there's a lot of information about the risk and the mortality and injury rates from hunting versus other activities. And the number of non-hunters that are killed in this country every year accidentally by hunters, you can usually count on one hand. And there are tens of millions of hunters in the United States. The number of people who die playing baseball, youth baseball in this country, averages three or four a year. Over a thousand people a year are killed by, in, by vehicles driven by people older than 75 that hit them or hit them on the street. We don't make everything illegal and ban everything that has some risk and threat. And there are a lot of legitimate uses, or a lot of legitimate reasons to hunt. I would encourage people to talk to hunters about why they hunt and understand it, because there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of what I consider irrational fear, meaning it's not based on the facts and the, the, the reality of the risks. And it's the kind of fear of the unknown that I think this community has rallied against over the years. It's fears of the unknown that made people prejudice against people who are different than them, people of different sexual orientations, people of different races. People feared the unknown. They didn't want those people around them in many parts of this country for a long time. And our community has always been open-minded and said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna understand what those other people are, how they're similar to me, and how they're different to me. I'm not just gonna reject them based on fear. So I would ask uh, everyone to do the same. I live in Florence on Sylvester Road. Tilt the mic. Okay. I live on Sylvester Road, and uh, there's a right of way that goes past my property, and uh, I don't go on it anymore. Uh, I go, try to go on it on Sundays, but even then I'm, I'm somewhat uh, uncomfortable. And I think that there's, there's two different things. One is fear being shot, and the other is simply the disruption that gunshots result in. And it's very disrupting to be walking in the woods and to hear gunshots, which I hear all the time. And I also want to just address the issue about tax credits because the Massachusetts uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, Department is also supported by my taxes as well. And in Western Massachusetts, they have managed 45,643 acres, which are open to hunters and fishers, fishing people. And they have 470 acres available uh, where there's no hunting and no fishing. So that's 61,000 versus 470 acres. So there is a lot of land in Western Massachusetts that's available for hunters and uh, very little managed by that organization that's available for non-hunters. So I, I don't want to see any land in Northampton open for hunting. <coughs> Uh, my name is Dale West, and I live in Northampton currently, and uh, my partner and I are, are building a house in Leeds um, up on uh, Chestnut Avenue Extension, which will be um, within, definitely within vocal range of one of the parcels. And I have four small children, and I'm really concerned about uh, the effect on them. I know when we used to play at Ryan Road at the school, um, the sound of gunshots would terrify them. And I'm not against hunting. I think hunting is just fine, but I, I don't want it near my house. I don't want it I don't want it impacting my children. I want my children to be able to feel comfortable playing with their friends in the woods when they get older. Um, and um, I also have concerns about the property values um, where we're where we're building our home, uh, the impact of hunting on property values. Um, and um, I also think that um, a couple uh, groups should be taken into consideration if they haven't been reached out to already or the folks that are living at Linda Manor um, and the folks at the, the VA as well. So, thank you. Hi, my name 
is Tony Peschel. Um, I live on Chesterfield Road. I just moved in with my wife. She spoke earlier with my son. I've got another one, twins. Um, I'm trying to listen to everybody. And my attitude about this was much more solid coming in than it is right now. And um, I just hope everyone can be open-minded and listen to each other. I'm trying to do. Um, I completely understand and respect the hunter's point of view and the not hunter's point of view. Um, I hope that there's some kind of balance we can all come to. Uh, doing it balanced and fair is probably the best way to make everybody happy. Uh, I hear people like to hunt. People don't like the sound of gunfire. Would it be possible just to do bow hunting? in this area, or at least have some kind of something that is listening to both sides. Um, I eat meat, mostly fish, uh, only fish since, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, I want to be able to catch the things that I eat, and I haven't caught a cow yet. <laughs> or a deer. <coughs> if I did, I don't know if I could kill one of them. But if it was necessary, I would wish I could, and I would wish I would have the ability to do so. And when my son caught that fish, it had been years since I had killed a fish. It took all its guts out and ate it. And I wasn't sure if I could do it, but I had done it. I remember my dad doing it with me, and it all came back, and I could do it again. Uh, so. You know, uh, I just want us to be respectful of the land and the animals. And if you're going to kill them, please eat them. And that's it. Thank you. My name is Kim Wojcik, and I'm a resident of Leeds. My son comes to school here, and I live in a neighborhood that was not shown on the map, in a neighborhood of 25 houses that is almost directly across from the Girl Scout Greenway. And I am opposed to adding more hunting area. I worry about gunshot sounds. Uh, I have dogs that are petrified of fireworks, and I can only imagine them not wanting to even be outside because of gunshot sounds. Um, the school is right there. My children have participated at Ryan Road also, and sitting there watching a baseball game, listening to the gunshots across the street was very hard to hear. And I know that um, it does affect property values in that neighborhood because I've had people say, I, you know, I don't want to live in that neighborhood because the gunshot sounds are too noisy. <laughs> Um, I agree, I love that our city is a sanctuary city, and I do think we welcome everyone, but I think the people we're welcoming, the gunshots affect everyone around. Um, if it was bow hunting, you know, I think that's a different thing because you're, not everyone is having to hear it. So I think we do want to welcome everyone here, but having to hear the sounds um, and have it affect your property value and have your kids hear it at the schools and just with all the, you know, the gun situation in our country, it just, I am not opposed to, I'm not in favor of adding any more space. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Kinner. I live out on Prospect Ave. Most of you know who I am because I'm a environmental police officer. For this situation where we all talk about hunting, the guns, I look at Mineral Hill. I would prefer to start off small, like bow and arrows, crossbows. Something like that, very simple, quiet. And then we continue on from there from a couple years down, if that work, add a gun, gun season, one week. Something like that. Start off small, work big, and everything. We have to work with each other. During a time period, I have stolen, I have seen stolen tree stands, cameras, from, not from hunters, but from people walking through the woods. We have major problems out there. The hunters out there just look at the deer. And believe it or not, I hunt. But most of the time, I fall asleep out there more than anything else. <laughs> you know, that way I get my quiet out of time. Because I'm busy. I'm busy all the time. You know? So just let you know, start off small. Think logic. Start off with bow and arrow. Something quiet, something easy and stuff. And then work out that way. Now I'll be asking, now all the hunters are asking, give them a chance, try something. 
don't, don't like it. It's some screen up there before. They stop hunting <coughs> and move it to somewhere else. Now they're asking. They're trying. But start small. I'm Kathy Gillespie, I live off of Ryan Road, and I hear gunshots all day, all the time, and on Sundays, because I live right next to the gun range that the police officers use to train with their weapons. And I've grown accustomed to it. I've lived there since 1989. I'm, a, I'm an animal lover. I have eight animals living in my house. And I don't hunt personally, but my family does. And I eat the meat from it, and I don't see any issues with that. And we shouldn't have to get in a car and drive a half an hour. If you want to go hiking, get in a car and drive for half an hour. Then you'll see how we're fe feeling pushed out. It's not fair. We shouldn't. We should be able to walk out our door and go hunting, as that gentleman stated. You can walk out your door and go go hiking or biking. So I think you all should open your minds and stop being so afraid of everything. Hi, my name is Rick Hart. I live on Lantern Street in Leeds. Um, I do actually often drive half an hour to hike because North Hampton doesn't have enough hiking trails. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not anti-hunting, um, and to me this is not a conservation or an environmental issue because most hunters I've known are very strong on those issues. Um, but it is a safety issue for me. I think truth in North Hampton is just too crowded and too small, and I think hunting should be more out in further out rural areas, large parcels. Um, like the state parks. Uh, you know, I, did, I looked up uh, before the meeting uh, fatality and, and hunting accident statistics, and it seemed as though most things were saying there were about a thousand a year in the US and Canada, and about a hundred fatalities, most of which were hunters, as some have said. But you know, it doesn't do much good to me to say I'm more likely to be killed by a car accident than, than a hunting accident if they're still saying, well, you might be killed by a hunting accident, or you might get injured, but it's not too likely. That's not good enough. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just it's a safety issue. Um, I don't mind what kind of shots they call me. Um, so I, I really would urge the city at least to restrict funding as much as possible, unless they're sure it can be in the places where there are not people, um, because other people, whatever. Uh, thanks. My name is Deb Jacobs. I live at 82 Grove Ave in Leeds, which is just down the street. Um, I'm one of the people who's been um, working on the um, Beaverbrook um, Greenway. And one of the things we're doing is putting up a uh, wildlife blind. Some of you may have noticed it. It doesn't have its stairs yet, but it'll, it'll all get done. And I, I would like the city, if they do allow hunting um, in that, um, on the other side of the Beaver Brook there, that they at least restrict it um, so that um, people using the wildlife land wouldn't be impacted by, by any hunting. And that's my um, main request for that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mac Everett, and uh, I live actually down closer to the river and I'm involved with a conservation group down here in the Meadow City Conservation Coalition that has taken responsibility to hold some conservation restrictions on public land in Northampton. And uh, so I'm not immediately affected by this in the sense that I'm not from the neighborhood, but um, I think I have the perspective of having gotten involved with the city and working on how to improve conservation land and when we approached the city and said we were interested in getting involved, the message we got very strongly was, okay, you need to submit a plan that is going to improve the habitat of the land and create, create an ecological plan. And we put a tremendous amount of effort into trying to figure out how to support the life that's there, the plants and the animals, and to make the habitat as good as possible in an environment where there's a lot of development going on, and habitat is being lost a lot. And, and so 
the city has eventually accepted the plan that we worked on, um, and it's been a great deal of effort, and it's, it's, it's hard for me as a result to think about the practice of hunting on conservation lands. Uh, and I, especially, I'm, there was a lot of talk about deer and bear hunting, but there are other species, fur-bearing animals like bobcats and foxes and so forth that maybe aren't so common that live in these habitats too, and I'm concerned about uh, the impact on those and, and possibly other creatures that I'm not thinking of at this point. So, um, and if we were going in the direction of compromise, I think the, the idea of bow and arrow hunting that has less impact would be something that, that I would give more consideration to. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kim Axsmith, and I'm on Water Street. And behind the house that I live in, there's a conservation land. And, um, I think it was about a couple weeks ago, Saturday, not a Sunday, <laughs> I'm out in a fenced-in area in our backyard with my dog, who's high-strung, and that's why I have the fenced-in area to keep her from running out. And I look up the hill, and I, I know pacing, so I would say it was about 100 feet up the hill, not at the crest, but halfway up is a teenage hunter, and I know it's a teenage, because I could tell it was a boy, young man, wearing hunting yard, with the rifle, pointing, hunting up towards the hill, thank God, not down. I was shocked. I was looking. I was like, what? I haven't seen anybody up there with a gun. I didn't know you could hunt up there. And you can't. And I yelled out to the young guy, and I know he heard me. And you know, the leaves are down. There's nothing, you know, sheltering my voice. He ignored me. I yelled louder. I said, hey, you need to turn around. I'm here. My dog is here. And the young man said, what? I said, are you hunting? He said, yeah. I said, could you? And I didn't know, because I was sort of ignorant, that this was not a hunting area. I said, could you move away from the houses? So the point I'm getting to is I've lived in Alaska, I've lived in the Adirondacks, I've lived with people who've hunted. I have nothing against hunting. In fact, what we're not talking about here is when the time and day comes when hunters are needed to cull out diseased animals, which in this area I don't see that happening, but there's a great purpose for hunting. However, around a highly populated area, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And if it's your taxes that you're having to pay too much for because you don't get to walk out your backyard and go cross-country ski, you know, you can't hunt like I can go out and cross-country ski, then you need, you could talk to the town about saying maybe you shouldn't have to pay for this this way. And maybe going to those other facilities, other areas that are not near people who are scared of gunshots. That's where your money should be spent. But around us, it's scary as hell. It's very scary. Nothing gets hunting, but around people and animals, it's, it's too freaky, especially in the day and age we live. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandy Glenn, and I live on Upland Road. And um, I guess I do support a lot of what people have said who would prefer that there be no hunting in um, uh, an area that's as populated as this. But for me, I'll, I'll focus um, primarily on the fact that the conservation land is like just, it's just so much. It's, it's designated as a certain area. And for me, um, one of the, the primary problems is that the sound, which is very loud, goes way beyond the conservation land area. And for me, that's not okay. And I would prefer that if people, and if people are going to hunt, at least with guns, that they do it in an area that I guess people are referring to state parks where it's not likely to impact the people who are trying to live peacefully, you know, from moment to moment. And I also would be open to um, bow uh, hunting if, you know, that were something uh, that would be a, um, a compromise. Thank you. I'm Penny Geis. I live almost next door here. I'm here because I'm concerned about ATV use. It's hard for me to see, to understand how running an ATV through an area helps conserve it. It's, if we are going to allow all-terrain vehicles to be 
going through the land we're trying to conserve, it seems to me we at least need to make sure that we have a group that is going to rigorously enforce paths and not have them be going anywhere. I absolutely love going four-wheeling out in Moab. I've gone out for Easter you know, safari. But that is so well controlled and regulated. The people that lead those coordinate with the police. If somebody's not staying on the trail, they call the sheriff, they helicopter the guy out, and he has to pay to get his vehicle gone. You know, some tearing up the, the ground without control is just seems to be the antithesis of conserving the land. So my concern is that when, when this plan is made for altering vehicles, a lot of thought be put into making sure that it's not destroying the environment that we're trying to protect. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patrick Brick. I'm from uh, Bear Street. Uh, this is my first year hunting. Um, I feel very unsafe driving a half hour, an hour, just to go hunting in woods that I don't know. I've went and scouted Mineral Hills, Rob Rug, stuff like that. Um, I feel safe there, closer to home. It's, you know, I just use a bow right now. I would have, you know, eventually advanced to a shotgun. If there are regulation to one week of shotgun in these areas, I'm for it. That's all. Thank you. Andrew Church, and I live on Spring Street. Every 50 years of my life, grew up hunting, and I think one of the big problems that we have there is the fact, and Wayne touched on it earlier, the city now controls or has purchased 25% of the open space in Northampton, which traditionally was used for hunting. Um, so all these parcels have been taken off, taken off, and they're yeah. You can go out to the western part of the state and other parts and stuff, but this gentleman just went on it. I don't want to get in my car and drive it out. I want to walk out my back door. <laughs> I've been doing it all my life. And quite frankly, one of the other problems is, you know what, there's no lines out there. And people get out in the woods, they have no clue whether they're on city property or private property. <clears throat> and half the time they end up getting lost when you see them walking down the road. So anyway, I'm for hunting. I think it all land within the city that's rural should be open to hunting. Circa 312 Chesterfield Road, and I'm not opposed to hunters or hunting, but uh, I have been hiking on the conservation trails in Northampton for 40 years, and I've never seen a hunter during those 40 years, and I'd like to keep it that way. And the other thing I'd like to add about all the people who are concerned with the noise of gunfire living on Chesterfield Road, I've heard gunfire for years. I always thought it was the National Guard. I hope it's not hunters hunting in the back. But anyway, uh, I, I just want to go on record as saying I'm opposed to any hunting land. On conservation land, not hunting in Northampton or anything else, but on conservation land. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Hall. I live on Chesterfield Road. Since uh, uh, somebody brought up the all-terrain vehicles, uh, I've hiked, uh, I've lived up, uh, up there for, since 1970, and I've hiked in Mineral Hills and so forth when my children were younger. 
But I was up that, I see they want to expand the Jeep Eater Trail, which I really have nothing against four-wheeling or anything. But I've walked that property and took pictures, and there's two to three feet of original ground that's totally eroded on conservation property. And if anybody goes on YouTube and looks at how they invite people in to use that area for Jeeps, uh, and look at the pictures, there's little young kids riding in those Jeeps and it shows the Jeeps tipping over and how, how the city of Northampton wants to expand something with that, a hazard like that, a conservation property, where all this erosion is taking place, uh, they shouldn't be doing it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Please come forward so that we're not stopping and starting. <laughs> my name is Erin Lamar. I live on Main Street in Leeds. And I guess my question mainly is whether it's right to frame this as a rights issue. Um, because I'm not sure who we're trying to serve and what the goal is. And if we want to make each other happy, I think we should call it that. But I'm not sure that we want to frame this in the same way we would a sanctuary city or as a rights issue. I'm not a hunter, I'm a hiker, I'm not opposed to hunting. Um, I don't know how I feel about this, but I do question the way that we're framing it. Thanks. Last chance, anybody? No, okay. Wayne, do you have anything you wanna conclude with? No, I mean, you know, we're, we're going forward, this has been really useful for us. Um, so, you know, my guess, back to the original question for our timing, my guess is we're probably about a month from having a draft plan out there. Um, and then we'll be open to comments for that right now, month before we get to the And I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I really appreciate the tone of how um, people shared their different thoughts and feelings about this uh, topic. Um, as I said before, NCTV has taped this, and it will be on be available probably tomorrow evening. I don't have a time when it's going to air or anything yet. So but if people want to tell their neighbors to watch it or you want to look back at it, you can see it. You can look online at NCTV. NorthamptonTV.org. Thank you. NorthamptonTV.org, you said? Yep. And um, if people want to talk to me about this more or Councillor O'Donnell, who's a councillor at large, please feel free to contact us via email, phone, um, or on the city website. And I, I just really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you.